Kia ora. Welcome to Conversations with Wahine, brought to you by the Wellington branch of the National Council of Women, New Zealand. Today on the show, we have Chris Pink and Penny Simmons. Chris Pink was first elected to Parliament in 2017 as a successor to John Key in the seat. He had joined the Royal New Zealand Navy in 2000. He also worked as the Government House as an aide-de-camp to the Governor-General in 2003. Later, Chris joined the Australian Defence Force and fulfilled his dream of serving in submarines. That must have been amazing. <laughs> You were appointed to the Navigating Officer of the HMAS Xi'an in 2006, and finally was stationed in the Northern Arabian Gulf in late 2007. You must have amazing stories on that. <laughs> yeah, pretty good times. <laughs> <laughs> Chris returned to New Zealand in 2008, where he completed his legal training, and then uh, this, culmi- this culminated in his admission to the bar in 2010, and working as a staff solicitor in Auckland. In late 2015, he established his own firm, leaving Ong and Pink lawyers behind in late 2017 to enter Parliament. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. We're excited to have you. Thank you for having me, guys. Excited to chat to you. Yeah, and secondly, we've got Penny Simmons. She is a Member of Parliament for Invercargill, and she was elected in 2020. She's currently the opposition spokesperson for tertiary education and skills, early childhood education and workforce planning, as well as the associate spokesperson for education and social development and employment. Until the dissolution of parliament on Friday, the 8th of September, she sat on the education and workforce select committees. Prior to her election to Parliament, Penny was the Chief Executive of Southern Institute of Technology, also known as SIT, from 1997 to 2020. She was a trustee of Community Trust South from 2012 to 2019 and chair from 2018 to 2019 and director of the Southern Lakes English College. Penny was a recipient of the Wolf Fisher Fellowship in 2000, and she was made a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit in the 2016 New Year's Honours List. She is also married with three adult daughters and five grandchildren. Welcome, Penny. Thank you. So you've both got really impressive resumes, and it's not just politics, but obviously you've had a really successful life before entering politics. So I know that, um, Penny, you also served in the New Zealand Territorial Force, which was renamed the Army Reserve for several years. I'd love to hear more about this and what did you do and how was the government support for the reserves back then compared to what it's like now? Well, my career in the territorials isn't near as dramatic and exciting as Chris's um, <laughs> being on submarines, so I'm a bit jealous there. Uh, so I spent seven years in the territorials, uh, and originally with 40 South in the infantry, which is based in uh, which was based in Dunedin, and then later with 34 Transport Troop based in in Bacargill. And the furthest I got was over to Townsville, um, Australia. But look, it was a great experience and a great thing to do as a young uh, young person, um, wonderful camaraderie, discipline, uh, just things that you don't get in everyday life, mixing with people from all different walks of life. So I found it a, a wonderful uh, time in my um, growing up. It was, it was just a great thing to do. Uh, Chris, I'll ask you this question. You served in the Australian Defence Force. You were a property lawyer. And since 2017, a politician, this is a vast array of different careers, very, very different. What inspired you to enter politics? Um, Well, I like the idea of problem solving. Um, And as a lawyer, you can do a bit of problem solving for each individual client, uh, one at a time, basically. Whereas I think in politics, um, if you're successful, and um, I haven't 
been that yet, and I'll explain that in a minute if I may. Um, you can solve problems for a, a large number of people at once um, across a whole area. So uh, and the reason I say I haven't yet been successful, um, even though I've tried hard as a local MP for my area to to problem solve for constituents who are having maybe difficulties with the government department uh, or there's a local issue that they need some help with uh, in terms of um, being in government that's when you can really make a difference if, if your team you know has the ministers who are you know determining the, the direction of the country so uh, I've been in for two terms so far and National's been in opposition for both those so um, I haven't experienced that opportunity to make a positive change at that high level but um, that's sort of what's motivated me to get into politics in the first place. Hmm, that's awesome. So what are both of your thoughts on the government's Defence Force funding increases which were announced this year? Uh, well, I I mean, I guess we're still well behind um, our allies in terms of proportion uh, percentage of our GDP. Obviously, it was really good to see an increase for the um, wages of uh, our defence personnel because they'd gone through some fairly tough times um, during COVID, having to a uh, man MIQ and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think that at least it was good to see that, but we still certainly fall well behind what our um, allies might expect from us. Yeah, I think it's a very good answer, if I may say. Um, you know, the Defence Force are very loyal in, in terms of um, being prepared to serve in a lot of different um, contexts, um, and they want to. That's why they sign up, and they don't do it for, um, you know, to get a you know, very high pay, but at the same time, we put people in a difficult situation if they're having to justify uh, to their families and themselves um, why they would do a job that's quite demanding in itself and also is, you know, more lowly paid in many cases than other public sector jobs, let alone comparing with the private sector and the, the valuable skills and attributes that these people um, often have. So, um, I, you know, I think, as Penny said, we regard it as a good move, a step in the right direction, uh, albeit that, that more could and perhaps should be done. Yeah, absolutely. The, the training that they go through alone can be incredibly intensive. I think at one point it was actually potentially a little too intensive. Am I correct in assuming that they've reformed that a little bit over the past five to ten years? Yeah, if, if, if I've sort of understood your um, question correctly, um, there's, I think it's fair to distinguish between training that's intense because it's very demanding physically and mentally um, in the way that we expect our troops who you know might be called in to serve in quite difficult situations and, and that's natural and that's right. Um, to the extent though that there's been um, historically some instances of abuse or harassment uh, or treating people um, with anything other than respect as, as human beings, uh, let alone as um, fellow soldiers, sailors, and, and air aviators. Um, clearly, that's not acceptable in 2023. Um, truth be told, it never was or should have been. Um, but but there was a culture, I think it's fair to say, in NZDF, uh, that is New Zealand Defence Force and elsewhere around the world. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the senior leadership and the forces uh, appear to have taken a very, uh, you know, appropriate and tough stance on that. Um, so, you know, we, sh we should always, as I say, um, expect um, high standards, um, of of those who you know put their hand up to serve but that shouldn't involve anything of a personally demeaning uh, or unsafe nature you know not unsafe in that sense anyway leading on from it penny you were the chief executive of the southern institute of technology from 1997 until you were voted into parliament in 2020 and you introduced a very successful zero fees scheme which had contributed to half a billion dollars to the GDP of Southland and created over 1,100 FTE jobs, along with helping many New Zealanders gain vital education without crippling debt. Currently, the Southern Institute of Technology is the only tertiary provider in New Zealand to offer a no tuition cost education to New Zealand students to study at all levels. How is it funded and how feasible is it for other tertiary institutions to take on a similar scheme rather than the current fees-free initiative that we have now? Mm, um, quite a lot of questions in there. <laughs> uh, so it is the only there for one more year because now with 
with all the polytechs combined, uh, Te Pukinga uh, is making the call on that, which is really, um, I think, unfortunate and quite insulting to the people of Southland uh, to be waiting on someone in Hamilton to say whether they can continue with their zero fees scheme. So um, it was set up originally with quite a bit of support from the local community. $7.25 million was given to SIT by um, local uh, philanthropic organisations in Southland, so the Community Trust and the Licensing Trust, as well as uh, the local authorities and a number of businesses. And they put that funding in to enable SIT to move from an average class size of 13 up to an average class size of 18, which enabled... Um, uh, the zero fees scheme to be um, self-sustaining because of the additional government funding that came in from that. So there were other um, institutions that did pick up on it. We worked really closely with Te Wananga o Aotearoa, uh, one of the, the large Wananga. Uh, we worked with them in the early 2000s to let them see our full budgeting process and how they might be able to do it. And they also picked up on it and allowed them to make uh, really considerable growth particularly around uh, Te Arareo Māori, um, the pathway uh, to language programs that they ran. So um, it was great to have that strategic relationship with them. It really can only work if you can increase your class sizes so that your um, fixed costs uh, stay much the same and your marginal costs are covered by being able to charge a small uh, resource or materials fee. So uh, it required a lot of financial discipline from our organisation, being very, very careful with, um, with our expenditure. But uh, we just had that wonderful buy-in support for from our local community that they could see the benefit in it for uh, local students, but also for uh, wider, for businesses. And we did very, very much get that um, ripple effect out into businesses and organisations in the whole of Invercargill and Southland. On that note, a lot of our universities have been struggling under an unsustainable funding model for quite a few years now a problem which has been made more dire after we closed the borders to international students under the COVID-19 debacle. While Labour have announced an education review along with added funding, the wounds within our education sector are far larger than the band-aid offered by the government this year. And we've seen that with like Victoria University going through many rounds of redundancies and cutting courses and really cutting back on what they're spending. Why have our tertiary institutions been increasingly strapped for this type of support, though? So they really are in the midst of a perfect storm of reduced um, numbers coming, domestic student numbers, as well as uh, reduced uh, international numbers that haven't come back since pre-COVID. And also the cost of living hits the universities just at, as it hits us as individuals and um, business organisations. I guess the one thing that I feel really sad for the universities is how slow we were to open our borders and then how we didn't get out and uh, recruit international students strongly in comparison with our competitor countries. So, for example, Australia and Canada um, have bounced back really quickly. They ensured that they had lots of incentives and ensured that their immigration policies were really closely aligned with the international student recruitment policies. Um, we just didn't give that level of certainty to international students in terms of um, post-study work visas, but also there was really uh, mixed messages going out. The minister at the time, Chris Hipkins, and the chair of Education New Zealand, Steve Mahari, um, made lots of comments about, oh, perhaps we don't want to get back to pre-COVID levels, perhaps it would be better if we did more delivery offshore and so there was real mixed messages being given to um, students and age agents um, where we would traditionally be looking to recruit students from so they've been hit really hard by that so not only only does that uh, impact on their financial income but of course those international students don't all come out of one or two programs that you can perhaps collapse them down they're right across programs and so 
you find that you're running a number of classes and programs on lower numbers, but you've still got all those overhead, those fixed overheads. So it's really hitting the universities very hard. Um, I guess there is some rationalization going on because of those lower numbers and we probably have to ask some of those hard questions like should there be seven music schools, should there be languages taught across nearly all our universities, perhaps we do have to have some of those conversations as well but um, the universities have certainly been put in a really difficult position, particularly with the international student numbers being down. Yeah, on that note, uh, in 2019, the International Education's direct financial contribution to New Zealand's GDP was $3.7 billion. This contribution in 2020, however, was $0.8 billion, so that's a huge change, as you were mentioning. Although we are expected to reach pre-pandemic levels by 230 how feasible is it to reduce our reliance on international students and protect our education sector if we need to close the borders again? Mm. And look, across um, across New Zealand, it was about $5 billion in total once you had that um, ripple effect out into the community. So it was really, really significant uh, for our our community, our economy, and our, our um, tertiary institutions. Uh, look, 2030 saying we'll be back to pre-COVID levels by 2030 is just too long for our tertiary institutions to be able to hold on. We really do have to go out there much more determined to get those international student numbers back. And look, it really isn't just for the money. I know uh, it feels like that's where the emphasis is but we have to remember we're a small country at the bottom of the world and we really need our domestic students to be getting that interaction and that exposure to international students from all over the world and the uh, long-term um benefits of having international students is really enormous in terms of building those relationships, people that go back to their own country and become senior business leaders or senior uh, government uh, officials or, or, or politicians. It's really critical that we have those links and those liaisons and those relationships. So it is more than just financial, but it's absolutely critical that we do get uh, significant numbers of international students back in a situation where we god forbid have another pandemic how would you do things differently would you want to keep the borders open to international students well, I mean, it's a hypothetical question and we wouldn't yeah. know what the situation was like, but there was a range of reactions. Uh, Canada, I believe, kept their uh, borders open to international students all the way through. Of course, Australia opened nearly a year quicker than we did and uh, got students back, had incentives to get students back much more quickly. So I think uh, in the future, there would be examples to be able to uh, look at and how they worked across other jurisdictions. Mm. Well, keeping in mind um, the funding for tertiary education, but also the recent um, increase in strikes that teachers, ECE and all teachers actually have had throughout the country because their salaries are not being paid enough, basically. In a scenario where National was elected and you were elected into Parliament again, how would you want to fund and reform the education system to reduce all these issues that we've been having? That's a very big question. That's <laughs> um, probably not something we can cover in five minutes here. Look, we have to be very cognizant of uh, our teachers and the comparisons in particularly Australia, because that's where we do tend to lose a number of our teachers too. Uh, I think that being um, very supportive of our teachers in terms of resources and materials 
It does feel like our, our teachers have been left uh, struggling a bit, and that's uh, part of the work that we've been doing. And, and obviously, Erica Stanford is our um, spokesperson in that area. But the um, policies that she has put forward in terms of doing the basics brilliantly and more recently on structured uh, literacy are very much about ensuring that teachers have the right resources because uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough time in the schools now. We know that about 25% of any one class um, off, will have um, neurodiverse challenges. And so, you know, our teachers are having to uh, address challenges uh, right across the board in terms of how they are teaching and the resources that they've got for their teaching. So the strikes and the negotiations, while the government isn't directly involved at as one of the negotiating parties, it did go on for far too long. It was really disruptive to students who had already had literally years of disruption with uh, COVID and the students, I think, I think really suffered from it. So through the 23 years that I was at SIT negotiating, making sure that you can get to the nub of the issues and try and get resolution and those compromises as quickly as possible is really important. But again, uh, government isn't directly involved in those negotiations. I guess that brings to light the question how much government should be involved in those situations or how much it should be left to tertiary education who work in that sector every day. Well, it's the, the ministry, obviously, um, with the compulsory sector and in the tertiary space, it is they are autonomous entities, and so uh, they do their own negotiations. And I think um, that it's really important that they have that autonomy. It is uh, in the legislation, and I doubt if there's any university or tertiary institution that wants to have any ministers with more hands-on involvement than they do at the moment. So that, that autonomy is incredibly precious, I think, to our tertiary sector and um, you know it's really important that we keep that. The pay parity <laughs> opt-in scheme seeks to address the disparity in pay between certified teachers working in education and care services and their counterparts working in kindergartens. Data from the 2020 and 2021 staffing surveys showed that certified teachers in education and care services received about 22,000 less than the equivalent teachers in a kindergarten. A welcome change for many, but if there's no systems in place to maintain parity long-term, ECE teachers could simply fall behind again. In the instance that National does win the election, what could you do to ensure pay parity in the long-term? Pay parity and pay equity, National absolutely uh, supports in principle. So really important to get that out there because I think there's been some misinformation and we wouldn't be winding back the commitments that have been made already. Um, but look, it is a really big question because um, our ECE sector is that split of um, private, mainly private, and also then the kindergartens. And we are in this really odd situation that of all the OECD countries, we our government puts more funding in than most countries do, but we have higher fees than most countries do. So there's a disconnect there. And looking at um, some of the Scandinavian countries that we would normally look towards for um, guidance and leadership in education, looking at Norway and Finland, for example, um, they have a slightly different approach. And, and when you look at somewhere like Norway, which is a very wealthy country, 40% of their income that comes from oil, they still don't have free um, ECE education and they also are looking to be able to get 30 percent of their ECE teachers fully trained by 2030. Now we're running somewhere around 80 to 100 percent fully qualified now fully degree qualified so again looking at Norway um, with only aiming towards 30 percent by 2030 they have a uh, secondary 
qualification, which is, they call it a vocational qualification. So I, I just think we're going to have to have a look across a range of things, um, our regulatory compliance environment, our uh, qualifications that we are expecting right uh, across um, centres, particularly at the moment where there's a skill shortage in fully qualified um, ECE teachers. And if they haven't got those fully qualified teachers, then they drop their funding levels. So I think we have to look at some uh, some more clever options and, and maybe have a look at places like Norway and Finland and what they are doing. So it, it, it is a really big question because um, we'd like our ratios to be better. We'd like our teachers to be paid more, but we're in this odd situation of spending more and expecting higher fees. And, and it's just not realistic to be able to keep putting our fees up. So it's a complex question. Thank you so much for your insights on the education system. So, Chris, now we've got a couple of questions for you. The prison system is always a source of contentious debate, largely from well-meaning people with the same goal, but very different views on how to get there. I'm hoping you can shed some light on a few of these questions. Just in the justice space, um, I think it's worth noting that um, when societies... Um, have a criminal justice system whereby um, you know certain consequences are brought forward for criminal offending um, there's actually a number of different reasons that you do that and the same uh, action can actually wrap up those uh, in more than one different way so uh, you know for example we say in in our uh, crimes act uh, and other legislation too uh, we have a situation where if you if you do a certain thing uh, you know might get put in prison um, for you know whatever period of time or might be home detention and by doing that we're hoping to deter people from doing the same offending another time that that same person um, and others as a society um, and so but there's also an element of punishment uh, which is to say that if you if you do a, a thing that's harmful to society and maybe harmful to other individuals you know namely the victims um, they're not a party to that court case criminal justice is between the state and the alleged offender um, but nevertheless there needs to be some some account taken of that and it doesn't need to be um, you know real um, eye for eye tooth for tooth um, um, kind of justice in a way that you know might bring forward ideas of retribution so much but there does need to be an acknowledgement of harm done and, and some sort of um, price paid for that that that's a, a an old uh, you know a long-standing uh, kind of moral idea that that most of the community would have um, but on a more uh, positive note if I can put it like that um, there's also um, the rehabilitation uh, that comes with um, a criminal justice system at its best that works well to say well uh, if people are um, at you know detained at his mas majesty's pleasure and um, then there's things that we can do that are worthwhile uh, for that person at that time which will actually improve their chances in life make it less likely that they'll re-offend um, and you know in, in a life of offending isn't good for the person doing it uh, any more than it is for those who who suffer the consequences of that offending so typically um, it might be education that's been missed along the way in terms of the person's, um, you know, young life. Uh, it might be that there are uh, head injuries or other, uh, or, or mental health illnesses or un other uh, maybe undiagnosed health conditions that it make it more likely that they'll be predisposed to offend. So addressing that root cause. Uh, it might be um, that there are, you know, substance abuse um, uh, issues, and where that is a principal driver of offending in this country, or at least some parts of it, um, we have specialist courts called alcohol and other drug treatment courts. So we. We can have nuanced responses to uh, the, the kinds of difficulties that people get in uh, and, and, you know, the, the aim of all these different types of uh, rationale for criminal justice um, consequences, be it punishment, deterrence, rehabilitation, um, should all be geared towards the same thing, which is producing fewer uh, instances of crime and fewer victims um, going forward. So while, um, as you rightly note, um, there are different um, political parties and philosophies um, geared towards achieving that aim um, at its heart. That... Yeah, I guess it's about finding the balance, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think it's a, a, a good um, point to make. I mean, it is it is a question of balance. Um, and, you know, there are plenty in the community who would have, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a tougher stance, if you want to put it like that, and others who sort of emphasize more so, um, you know, the, the, the softer aspects. Um, 
but you know we should all want the same thing ultimately and 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 where we have, have a difference of opinion that's a legitimate thing for political parties to discuss particularly in an election campaign um but then also you know there's these big picture issues in terms of how individuals and societies interact um it might be for example that we say the, the wishes of the victim should be taken into account and that's a really popular notion um but if you have um you know two identical crimes that are uh, carried out and, and the, the family of one victim is, is you know inclined to be very forgiving and want to have a, a lesser punishment uh, than you know the the equivalent identical um, situation then we're going to have different results for the same offending and that that offends our general principle of the rule of law whereby um, equal um, you know um, offending should be treated equally so you know pretty challenging discussions and conversations philosophically let alone you know when you get the practicalities of, of how to apply this stuff but you know it's pretty fascinating um, and you know a, a good problem solving approach by government I think will you know we hope and, and expect uh, you know might might have something to do to um, reduce the, the the level of crime that we're seeing at the moment. Definitely it's very interesting something we could probably talk about for hours but on the subject of youth offending young Māori are significantly and persistently over represented in the criminal justice system both as victims and offenders. How can we effectively combine the complementary strengths of iwi Māori and governments after years of well-intentioned but poorly coordinated initiatives? Again, another great question. And again, we could be, you know, all night um, discussing that. Um, but as we don't have all night, um, I'll certainly give my, um, you know, best 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 foot forward in terms of um, you know some of the approaches we can take um, I think something that's been helpful um, that actually was started under the last national government um, but continued under the current one um, you know and, and to give credit where it's due I think um, parties that um, operate in good faith in the space and recognize that good ideas are worth um, continuing across successive governments um, are helpful if we can get that kind of cooperation going because of course uh, you know if we're to have any success in reforming um, justice including youth justice and and for you know the Maori um, sections of society both as you know offenders sadly and victims also sadly then then it's going to need to be an intergenerational effort and that implies uh, across governments of six or nine years uh, you know you know multiple um, iterations of, of different governments so um, you know, so 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 the rangatahi or youth courts um, uh, are ones that I've seen operating. I've, I've visited them out in, in West Auckland at Hwani Waititi Marae, um, and that's a really good um, scenario whereby uh, young people, and they don't have to be Māori and ethnicity, which to me is important, it should be available to everyone because we treat people equally under the law, um, but nevertheless they can come in and um, uh, have an opportunity to be examined and examine themselves from a whakapapa point of view uh, and to know that um, they've come from, uh, you know, um, a proud history um, of um, lineage um, uh, such that um, their, their tupuna or their ancestors um, might not regard the, 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 you know, the lifestyle that these young people have got into as, as very worthy and, and, and they're encouraged to see themselves as part of something bigger and, and a greater a whole and, and not just to see their own circumstances now as hopeless um, and I perhaps haven't done it justice but but to see it working in operation and to see uh, seeing young people come in and, and be encouraged to, to have some pride in themselves and who they are and, and the most holistic uh, way possible actually does often um, produce uh, results that that I'm sure would be better than a more traditional approach um, but you know that 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 requires people uh, involved in such a system to want to engage you know there's got to be a demission of of um you know needing to do better so you know where those um, kind of approaches can work uh, for iwi maori and, and for others again i hasten to add needs to be available to all and it is um then you know that's that's the opportunity for something positive we can do the national policies of making gang membership an aggravating factor at sentencing and limiting judges ability to reduce sentences with a maximum discount of 40 percent what would reduce the likelihood that sentences were downgraded from imprisonment to home detention for gang members and also on that what is the likelihood that gang involvement is already considered when sentencing offenders and is it the government's place to limit judges discretion when sentencing offenders 
Yeah, um, a lot on that and, um, you know, all very worthy points for discussion. I think taking that last point first, um, it is totally legitimate for um, politicians um, to have a role in setting uh, guidelines or parameters for sentencing. Um, you know, we have a, a Sentencing Act, um, and as the name would suggest, um, it deals with sentencing and it's an act of parliament, um, which is to say that the duly elected uh, members of the government uh, you know, get to decide these things. Now, they decide what the, the framework is. Of course, they don't decide in any individual case. Uh, and if it were the case that politicians um, would have the opportunity to to decide how we, any individual were punished on, on a finding of guilty, then, you know, we'd end up with a corrupt system because that would be too great a concentration of power by those making the laws and also applying them. So, you know, we can separate out those things. Um, and I guess the grey zone in the middle is, is how much discretion we give judges. Um, it seems to me, um, and actually, you know, most people that I talk to in my area, and I think it's fair to say um, across New Zealand, um, have the feeling that community expectations of uh, sentencing um, haven't been met uh, lately in a, in a lot of cases. Um, and again, I shouldn't talk about the specific examples, and I don't intend to, but um, oftentimes um, some pretty horrific uh, violent offending has taken place and has resulted uh, not in a prison sentence but a, a home detention um, uh, type scenario um, and in some cases where that's led or enabled um, further offending in the community then then clearly that's not acceptable um, and and so why we've talked about um, reducing the ability of judges to give discounts um, uh, is, is basically to recognise that and, and to respond to the will of the people to, uh, you know, have, have a more appropriate sentencing regime. So one of the things we've said is that you can't get a discount um, for being a youth offender more than once. So you can get it the first time. We can say, you know, you might be a young person and make an honest mistake um, or, you know, a... a you know, a, a rash mistake, um, but you can't keep playing that card because from a victim's point of view, it doesn't matter uh, if the person who, um, you know, uh, you know, murdered a loved one or, you know, or, or um, you know, assaulted them or whatever the case may be, was 14 or 40. For them, um, you know, the, the result's the same still. So it's an acknowledgement of, of viewing uh, offending from a victim's perspective as well as in a, you know, we think quite a holistic kind of way. So, um, you know, so we don't think that, that it's appropriate to have, um, you know, either multiple instances of a person getting um, a discount for the same thing because it shows that they not haven't learned that lesson, that, that one off uh, following that first offence. Um, and the other one is to limit the sentence discounts to 40% means that what Parliament you know the, the people's representatives for for better or worse that's that's what we are in any given three year term um have determined and, and we think that that the will of the parliament should be met in terms of those sentencing guidelines and if they're reduced artificially to the point of being discounted to half or more then um that's that's clearly not meeting those expectations and those guidelines so we cap it at 40 percent um otherwise it's just too easy for judges to uh, reduce sentences down artificially from say five years uh, imprisonment which would be you know if that's the starting point down to two years and then a two-year imprisonment can automatically uh, be reduced down to home detention and then suddenly before you know it's a pretty horrific crime is met with no greater consequence than someone having to sit around at home for a couple of years maybe on electronic monitoring and and able to actually get out and about and, and live a pretty uninhibited uninhibited life which we just don't think is right so there's a bit of a rebalancing there that we're you know quite happy and prepared to do in consideration of the fact that most GAM members do have a care and protection history, what kind of information sharing actually happens between Oranga Tamariki and Corrections to identify and support at-risk children and youth early? Yeah, great question. I mean, the temptation is, um, the, you know, the easy and, and glib answer would be not enough. Um, and I think it's fair to say that we don't want government departments to act in silos and miss opportunities to intervene in a positive way. But at the same time, you know, you've got to be careful because otherwise if people are interacting with uh, those who come into the home um, with an aim of helping them, um, you know, and, and the results aren't always great, but but at least let's accept for the sake of argument, people working for OT are going in there with the best of intentions and trying to sort out problems and we want them to understand in reality what, what the difficulties are in a, in a household environment. Mm -hmm. um, we know, you know, it seems obvious to me that if if we say there might be a criminal consequence 
um, off the back of being open with, um, you know, the government authorities because that gets passed to the police or, um, you know, the justice system in general, um, then actually they're, they're not going to want to interact with the state. Um, and so we'll lose the um, openness of, um, you know, the willingness of people to engage and, and, and share what is actually going on. So um, there's no easy answer, um, but um, I will just say actually, because I neglected to answer the aspect of the previous question regarding uh, gang membership and uh, participation as an aggravating factor. Um, it's true that that does currently exist, um, but we have seen uh, nevertheless uh, gang uh, membership influence uh, and frankly ill effects on society increase markedly in the last few years uh, and we just think that a bit of a rebalance is needed and we need to use um, you know, some more of the tools that are available to us as a state to protect our citizens who are on the wrong end of that. Um, and, and just to loop back to a previous question, as um, you rightly noted, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, Māori communities that are disproportionately affected uh, when, you know, offending is done by Māori and, and the same, you know, that's true geographically as well, including across ethnicity. So, you know, we've got to protect um, the vulnerable uh, and, and all members of society for that matter. So, you know, we need to be um, quite prepared to use, um, you know, pull the levers of the state in order to do that. And on the um, theme of youth and youth offending, RAM raids are at an all-time high and most of them are committed by youth and they estimated to actually happen once every 15 minutes in New Zealand at the moment. But over 40% of young offenders up to the age of 20 that enter prison are more likely than the general prison population to be re-imprisoned at some point in their life. And the reconviction rates within 12 months of release are even higher than that. In addition, to that, between 50 and 75% of youth involved in the justice system meet the diagnostic criteria for at least one mental or, or substance mental health or substance use disorder versus 13% of youth generally. Um, you mentioned this before as well that you know you'd look into the reasons why these crimes are happening if there's a background reason or a health issue. But are you able to elaborate more on how National are looking at improving our prison system as a whole, the support that the prisoners get and wraparound services to reduce it or to ensure that the reoffending rates uh, reduce in the future? Yeah, um, yes, another great question. Um, a big uh, one. <laughs> yeah, another big one, right? Um, and uh, at the risk of seeming like I'm going to avoid the question, because there's a couple of things that I want to answer very specifically um, to it. But nevertheless, in the first instance, we've got to, um, you know, reduce as much as possible the instances of those who, you know, fall between the cracks of various systems, uh, be it education, health, uh, social welfare, um, you know, or perhaps um, conversely, those who are, are, are too involved in the social welfare system because they haven't had those other opportunities, uh, and, and and you know they've maybe grown up in a in a, a home of dependency and not had that role modelling of, uh, you know, mum or dad or whoever the parent is uh, going out and 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 having a you know work to support themselves and their far no in their community. So um, as much as possible, we need to avoid that situation. But but of course, you're right to acknowledge that nevertheless there are people who um, are more likely to to uh, be involved in um, offending who have got, you know, issues going on in their lives that are complex. Um, one of the things we've said that we'll do as, as National Party policy leading up to the election um, is that um, we will uh, make available rehabilitation uh, to people who uh, have been, you know, who are what we'd call remand prisoners. So, so that you know they're detained, having been accused of a, a you know a serious criminal offence. They haven't been found guilty, so um, you know the state can't uh, and shouldn't punish them, um, and they can't and shouldn't require them to undergo rehabilitation because that would be, uh, you know, um, uh, something that we would require of of someone who's done wrong. But actually, if we say to make available to a person, um, you know, the help that they might need, uh, you know, again could be health, um, could be, you know, any number of different things and say, well, look, this is going to enable you to live a better life, regardless of whether we then find you guilty of this thing uh, that you've been accused of. Um, and at the moment, the justice system is so utterly broken in terms of the amount of time that it takes for cases to come to trial um, that we've got half of the prison population are remand prisoners. So half of them aren't even having been found guilty of anything. They've just been, uh, you know, locked up pending trial. And, and it's a dysfunctional system that actually, uh, you know, effectively presumes people uh, guilty um, when they 
are entitled to be presumed innocent until proven guilty, unless proven guilty. So, um, you know, it's all it's all backwards at the moment, but we think we can offer people help uh, in the circumstances in which we find them guilty or not. Uh, and if they want to take advantage of that, they're less likely to be on that um, that treadmill of crime uh, and, and, you know, that revolving door um, policy with prisons. Um, you know, and that in turn leads into, you know, discussions about insecure housing. I mean, if you're more likely to get fed and, and housed and clothed uh, behind bars, than than in normal society, then um, that's an indictment on, you know, lots of other parts of of the social welfare safety net. So, you know, these are big complex problems and, and, you know, to the extent they're justice problems, they're equally education and, you know, and social and and so forth. So, um, you know, a lot of of work's going to need to be done by the next government, whoever it may be, um, at time of recording in 33 days from now. So um, we'll just have to see and, you know, good luck. Good luck and God bless to whoever that is. Yeah. I read something about National bringing in essentially boot camp style ways of reducing reoffending. But from my research, harsh punishments, they've often been shown to have little deterrent effect on young people. And boot camps have a track record of ineffective results and scared straight programs have also actually been shown to increase crime. I guess it's because young offenders often find the thrill or emotional high in violent offending. And I think the social rewards, such as admiration from their peers, are more important to them at the time than concerns about actually being caught. Are boot camps run by the military still on the cards for National? And if so, how will they differ from previous attempts that the partner has made to use this method in order to help our youth or justice system? Yeah. Um, so in terms of the social rewards that you quite rightly identify, um, one of our policies is to say, and actually it's been mirrored by the current government, um, you know, we say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, so <laughs> well done to them. At least uh, something's been done. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So they've said, you know, they'll pick up the policy that we had, which is to say that um, it'll be an aggravating um, offence uh, or factor, excuse me, in an offence being committed, for example, a ram raid, classic example, posted to social media for the likes, for the notion variety for that social reward and we say well that you know that you should be disadvantaged for that if you're doing that because um you know frankly it's pretty disrespectful to the victims and also if that's that kind of um uh uh, behavior is driving the offending in the first place, then of course we want to clamp down on that. In terms of the so-called boot camps, um, that's not a word that a- appears in our policy, and we've got a, a different idea of um, how we're going to run the military-style young offenders academies. Um, and I know people will point to um, previous iterations that sound quite similar, um, and you know, uh, it's pretty hard to get a, a really good um, reduction in reoffending rate. There's not a lot of programs that have got as high a percentage as, as you would want, um, but we think done well these these programs will actually be effective because um you know it's it's not actually a hardcore uh punishment regime it's actually an opportunity for some of the best leaders in society um in the defense force you know you might get a, a penny simmons um for example um or actually have, you know a number of different um uh, current national mps dr shane Ritty, um tim van der Mollen, um andrew bailey uh, myself um and gosh i think there's one other now i'm embarrassed of Joseph Mooney, Joseph that's right. Mooney. Thank you. Phew, good save, Penny. Um, thank you. Um, anyway, so so a number of us sort of understand the benefits of of being involved in the defence force as a young person, and 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 it's not it's not necessarily um, of a punishment nature. I mean, you know, some of us voluntarily joined up. We, it wasn't sort of you know the army or jail kind of scenario, but nevertheless, you know, discipline and uh, and um, you know being part of a team um, and self respect. Um, and, uh, you know, some of these things can actually be really valuable for a young person in their life um, when they've lacked that direction, whether it's because of family or community circumstances and sometimes a safe environment um, that, you know, has high expectations of them can actually be the best thing that they, they can have. So we think some will respond positively to that. And, um, you know, at this stage, it's, it's definitely worth giving a go. Yeah, the studies that I was looking at was it was very much around boot camps themselves and they were enacted as a form of punishment i'd be really interested to get more detail on how the national party are actually wanting to initiate this is it is it very much just like a military school that's focused on either rehabilitation or discipline as you mentioned um i I think it would be sort of rehabilitative in its focus um 
because the idea is that you know we give people skills and opportunities that they ha they haven't had in their life so far or wouldn't have by going to jail and interacting with older prisoners who you know would, would probably welcome the opportunity to recruit from a gang perspective um so it is different and i mean if it wasn't different we wouldn't, wouldn't bother doing it there's no point simply branding these things um but um you know it's worth notice uh, noting that there are um uh um, gosh, Penny might help me out with the name. I'm trying to think. You know, you, 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 the, the the worst organisations in, in in the world for acronyms are, are, are military and government, and this is a sort of a cross section of both. So, but anyway, the sort of the, the, these young sort of youth service academies, um, where people have an opportunity, and I think it's run through um, Ministry of Social Development. I'm sort of looking Penny's direction. She'll no doubt correct me or contradict me if I'm if I'm going off the beaten path here. But um, you know, you, there are these um, relatively short term programs. Um, and they exist in places like um, Fenuapai, um Air Airbase, um, within my electorate, actually. I'll see if I can point to it on the map, something like that behind me. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, and they do great work and they, they try and help turn young lives around. But, you know, a short space of time, it's not easy to make a big difference. Um, Penny, is there anything you'd add there? No, and I'm trying to remember the name. And uh, I was talking to someone about it the other day, sorry, and I've just forgotten. Yeah. But, yeah, they have been running for some time. Um be voluntary yeah. service something be as yeah I'll discover that just can't remember them uh, and they are uh, I think doing exactly uh, as you said Chris they are giving that uh, rehabilitation opportunity they are yes there's some discipline in amongst that but often that's just sort of setting boundaries and direction for people and uh, giving opportunities around things that they might have missed out on before and and it could be around numeracy and literacy and and understanding what it is that perhaps has um, made learning for them a challenge so yeah that they are i think um pr providing and have provided for a number of years a really good opportunity for a number of young people people that are almost on that space of stepping into the, the wrong side of the law. I guess uh, another interesting point would be if that takes youth out of something like a youth justice residence, then it's possible that it would be less likely that they find, I guess you could say, a family when it comes to gang affiliation. And I think it ties into our welfare that works policy around uh, supporting people into employment because we know that employment is a really important part of keeping uh, young people out of jail and out of trouble and so that wraparound support for under 25 year olds that uh, we are envisaging so uh, you know providing a more holistic um, approach to getting pe young people into employment looking at what the barriers are whether they do have um, uh, drug and alcohol addiction problems whether they do have neurodiverse uh, issues that have stopped them being able to learn properly whether they haven't been able to get a driver's license. So uh, providing that support of identifying what it is that's creating barriers to young people getting into employment and then working with them to reduce those barriers. So I, that's that preventative work at the um, at the stage prior to them getting into trouble. So it, it's got to all be linked up. We've got to be really focused on uh, providing the support that's going to work. Mm -hmm. So it's quite quite obvious that the justice system and education system are linked in many ways. You know, like the more education people have, then hopefully the less they'll be part of the prison system. And I guess it's a going concern that we have, like the cost with the cost of living increasing, education kind of becomes lower and lower on the priority list for people that can't afford it. And then it, there's a vicious cycle, right? So there's a lot of yeah. issues that the next government has to deal with, as you've mentioned. Um, one thing, and this is skewing away from nationals policies and all of that, but one thing, you know, with the two of you being relatively new in parliament, with Penny, you being elected, uh, coming to the end of your first term and Chris coming to the end of your second term, so fairly new compared to a lot of other politicians. I guess with COVID happening from 2020, you know, for the last three years, basically, um, how did it affect the way you thought um, it would be being in the opposition? I guess, you know, the government's um, focus changed all of a sudden at the beginning of 2020 to 
getting New Zealand into COVID recovery. And while National weren't the um, governing body making all the decisions, how did being part of a, a, a government that was looking after COVID, how did it affect um, being part of National in that time? Um, okay, I'll, I'll have the first crack then. Thank you. Um, so look, I mean, it was a really tough time for the country as a whole. Um, and it was a tough time to be a politician. I think um, if you're in government, there was a lot of responsibility um, to make um, decisions that were very weighty, um, and which, you know, many of the citizens had different ideas on. Um, and to some extent, you know, every every time of governing or every major crisis does feature that. Um, but nevertheless, it was, you know, incredibly intense time uh, for the governing party. From an opposition point of view, it was really difficult because, um, you know, we have a constitutional duty. Um, you know, it's not a right, it's a responsibility, actually, to hold the government to account, by which we mean, you know, not necessarily acting in a political manner, but to propose um, other ways of doing things and going, uh, you know, um, you know, it might be further or faster, or it might be, you know, slower, or, you know, as the case may be, you know, it's important that, um, that there is an opportunity for the other side of politics from from that which holds the, the keys um, to the castle at any given time, you know, makes makes those points because um, by having that contest of ideas and um, the country as a whole can judge, um, you know, what's best for the response. But during the COVID um, time, I think because a lot of people were, you know, very fearful and reasonably so, um, the, the rhetoric around having uh, to unite against COVID-19 um, implied that anyone who was, um, you know, making other suggestions of, of public policy was um, therefore by definition being divisive. Uh, you know, and if you have a team of 5 million and one person says, uh, for example, just to use myself as an example, uh, why shouldn't butchers, bakers and greengrocers be able to offer their wares, um, you know, thereby supporting local businesses and actually from a public health point of view, having less um, interaction than, than by having only the major supermarkets open and everyone crowding to those. Um, you know, I was I was um, pretty roundly um, criticised on social media for suggesting that at a local level, um, because if you know if we have a team of five million all on the same page and and um, agreeing with the things that are said in the one pm press conferences, then by definition, if you've got a different idea about how things might be done, then you're outside that team and there's a team of four million nine hundred ninety nine etc. Uh, and then then one guy who's off doing his own thing and and um, you know I, th I think unfortunately. Unfortunately, we did see um, an air that pervaded um, society at that time, and including the political environment and the media environment and the social media environment um, that, that was um, pretty hostile to even good faith other views. Um, and, you know, the, the case of New Zealanders and others who were locked out of this country at that time. So unfortunately, I think it was a bit of a, a chapter in our history, which will reflect um, on, you know, some, some attitudes of, of um, divisiveness, not from those who, you know, wanted to propose other ways that we could operate as a country um, from a position of opposition who's, you know, whose job title suggests exactly what, you know, what we, they should be doing. Um, but, you know, that's that's sort of in the rearview mirror now, I guess, but some lessons to, for all of us to learn going forward. I was new in, so I didn't actually know any different. So, um, you know, I, I've got nothing to compare it with. But I agree with the comments that uh, Chris has made that it it did quickly turn into something that was quite divisive, I think, for our country from that initial uh, sort of unity. Then the unity became so all-encompassing that it in actual fact became divisive. And I think that's been a really sad, lingering um, uh, legacy of COVID and perhaps our handling of COVID. So uh, that I think there's some really big social issues for us to overcome as a country um, from it and, and how long it will take our country to get over that will be a really interesting point to see. Yeah, what are your thoughts on COVID-19 and the fact that schools were shut down young children weren't able to socialize and now a couple of years later we are actually seeing an increase in things like youth offending i'll be curious to know what kind of correlation that has 
Yeah, I mean, it's still it, it's still very raw in the minds of people that were really impacted by it. Just a couple of days ago, I was um, at a, a retirement village talking to a woman that I knew and her husband. Um, I had known him as well, who died in the midst of COVID, and she didn't see him for five days before he died and never got to say goodbye. And I'm not sure she'll ever recover from that. Uh, so I think there are those lingering uh, resentments and they uh, find it really difficult to move on from it so that's uh, at that end of the spectrum and then we have a number of young children who have really missed out on significant parts of their education and we see that by the uh, lower retention rates of uh, first year university students, school leavers uh, entering university just not well enough prepared for that so the impact's going to be far-reaching for a long period of time, and I suspect that it's going to take uh, quite a lot for us to get over a number of those things as individuals and as a society. So uh, I think it's going to be a work in progress for, for many years. Mm, I think you've nailed it, Penny, from my point of view. So, Chris, as the cyclone recovery spokesperson, you must have some thoughts on what we need to do to reduce our effects on climate change and these severe weather events that are becoming more frequent. I mean, your question is an excellent one, uh, and, and, and it sort of touches on um, a couple of different aspects, I think, which is, um, you know, climate change, we talk about uh, mitigation and adaptation. So uh, clearly we need to reduce our emissions as much as possible uh, to avoid exacerbating those uh, severe weather events that we've already seen, uh, you know, too much of in, in the last uh, 12 months uh, in this country. And of course, Cyclone Gabriel being an example, but other recent major flooding events as well. Um, and then, of course, there's the adaptation piece, which is, you know, how, how do we sort of um, uh, prepare ourselves for the inevitability that when heavy weather hits, um, you know, it might be in the form of, um, you know, high winds or uh, flooding or some combination uh, that, and, and, you know, landslides that go along with it, all those, all those other effects that that we need to be able to uh, have an environment, um, you know, a literal environment, but also in terms of human habitation and, and you know, zoning decisions and all those things that go to, to make up resilience. Uh, you know, we need to have made the, the decisions for that stuff going forward um, in a way that recognises, um, you know, the reality of the world we live in and, and has learned the lessons from, again, just an example, but but a recent one and a major one at that being Cyclone Gabriel. So there's lots of things we can and should do. Um, and the National Party, you know, we we see the need for uh, mitigation and adaptation. Um, and the centrepiece of our, our climate policy that we've announced so far as, as that time of recording um, is Electrify New Zealand, which is the name of the policy we have, uh, which is um, you know, very much geared to what you would expect from the name of it, which is to say, um, well, look, if we reduce dependence on fossil fuels, uh, we need to have renewable sources of uh, power generation um, that will produce electricity. Uh, and and there's a lot of appetite, actually, in, in both private and public sectors uh, to um, to build the infrastructure that's needed, be it, uh, you know, hydro, wind, solar, uh, and other uh, methods of, of, you know, quite sustainably um, generating energy, but we've got to have an environment where people can actually carry out those projects. Um, it's a cost effective, it's it's timely, uh, and so forth. So that's, that's really what we're hoping to do with that policy. Uh, and of course, the other practical measures that go along with it, uh, transport emissions are, are a major sector, um, along with some others, to be fair, but uh, in that space, we say, well, it's all very well to encourage people to uh, buy electric vehicles and there's incentives um, that can be uh, put in place for that but if, if people don't have the confidence that they can use them in all parts of New Zealand um, and they you know if they suffer from that range anxiety as it's called uh, then then we need to have enough charging stations and infrastructure to enable people to to confidently go forward and make those purchasing decisions without disadvantaging their family or their business or their you know community group for that matter yeah so just to finish off and to finish on a lighter note, um, can you both leave us with the most memorable, surprising, or funny moment that you've experienced in your career in Parliament so far? Um, Penny, we'll go with you first. Bonus points if it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to be saying this, but I will, and the, the <laughs> colleague will remain nameless, although... Even better. 
<laughs> well, it's certain hand sides and on parliamentary TV. So, um, so often late at night, things get quite a lot more relaxed in the house. And um, a, a dear colleague of ours was talking about some of our policy work around um, extending the age for free mammograms. Now, mammograms are quite a different word to get, get around. Chris is making a face at me. Perhaps I should be stopping right now. No, no, you're right. <laughs> but no, you're good. Colleague, I just um, I don't know what you're saying. Yeah. You're remembering it, and a colleague had four or five goes. He called them memories and mammons <laughs> and and mammals and mammographies. And in the finish, he was just about beside himself, and he just put his hands in front of his chest, which would have been not so bad. But he kept turning them like a doorknob, and we were all in hysterics over it. So um, so the 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 thing was all quite. Um, sensible. It was talking about us extending mammograms for um, older women and a very good thing to be talking about. He just couldn't get the word out. <laughs> I think mammals, uh, mammoths, <laughs> the list goes on. That's great. Went everywhere. <laughs> what about you, Chris? Well, I can't, I can't top that, but um, <laughs> um, there was a, a rather um, uh, nice moment at the Final select committee uh, that uh, Nick Smith um, attended, and um, he brought in um, muffins uh, for for the you know fellow members of the select committee, being um, MPs from across the different parties, and and no doubt shared with the um, uh, staffers as well. But the reason this was quite funny was because it referenced a, a story that Nick had told the select committee previously uh, about how when he was environment minister, um, some environmental activists um, as a sort of a, a form of protest had made some muffins for Nick and presented them to him and he, he duly um, appreciated in, in, in the way that, you know, you would have presented with um, ostensibly very edible, tasty food. Um, and you may be able to see where I'm going with this, but suffice to say they had an, a non-standard ingredient um, in them and um, the ones that had been given to Nick by this protest group, I hasten to add. And um, I can't remember what it was, but it wasn't chocolate. And, um, and, and so Nick, replicated this with muffins except to say he used you know you know something that you would actually find in the Edmunds cookbook for example so um everyone sort of had a good old laugh at <laughs> it's sort of at his expense but but you know it was a, a self-deprecating thing that he did to um uh, to mark his final occasion of being on a select committee and, and to reminisce about some of the tougher times for the National Party uh, former Minister of the Environment. Oh well I'm sure there's more tough times to come and probably some really great times too. I look forward to seeing what happens in these elections. Is there anything else any of you would like to say before we finish? I just can't believe you didn't tell me it will be on YouTube and I didn't wear any makeup. <laughs> well, up to you. If you would rather it wasn't on YouTube, that's absolutely fine. It's something that's quite new. So uh, we only just fine. kind of started telling people now. <laughs> I'm not that I, vain. <laughs> I thought you looked good, Penny, and you sounded even better. Um, <laughs> hey, can I just say, um, with a, a time of recording 33 days to go until voting closes and just 21 days until it starts, um, I just really encourage all your listeners and subscribers and members to um, get out and vote, whoever you vote for. Obviously, Penny and I have got you know, a particular view on who that should be for, um, <laughs> Team Blue, but actually, you know, it's a democratic right and I would say responsibility too. So just encourage everyone to get out there and, and make it happen and, um, you know, let the cards um uh fall where they lie and um and you know we'll, we'll take it from there and the politicians will get their say for the following three years but you know get involved i reckon um because otherwise you know you're missing out on a great advantage of this beautiful country of ours and its strong democracy and, and thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to uh, speak at length about things that we're passionate about because normally they're sort of 15 second bites on media and so it's lovely to have a little bit uh, longer to actually talk about the details of things. I would love to have you both on again for more detailed discussions. Obviously, there's only so much we can get through in an interview such as this, but Maybe after the elections, we can speak on certain topics and really get into the nitty gritty of it. Is there anything you would like to say quickly, Harita? Um, no, I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time. I know it's been over an hour, but like you said, it's so important to talk about the policies you have, the ideas that you have. And like we've covered this in quite a few interviews we've done before where we've asked the politicians, you know, 
quite often when you're giving a media talk or if you're being interviewed on TV or something or by a journalist, quite often you're only given like 30 seconds to answer a question and then they cut you off. Sometimes they misinterpret what you said. So yeah, our whole point was just to like let you get your message across and, you know, not butt in and not, you know, give you the space that you need to actually talk about what's important. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. And I hope our listeners could kind of see the link between both of your portfolios as well. Um, because sometimes some portfolios seem very different. But, you know, like I mentioned before, justice and education really go hand in hand when you really think about it. Um, so yeah, it was really good to have you both on together as well. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, team. Great. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been Haley and Harissa with Penny Simmons and Chris Pink. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And thank you to our listeners as well.